Hello there, it's Grandma again. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. His radio transcripts from a radio show that broadcast in the 1950s. Enjoy! Well, we stuck pretty close to the borderline of history in our hometown scrapbook so far, but tonight we flip the page to one of the most colorful characters that ever roamed the streets of the harbor cities, and he roamed them all. A barrel-chested, graph voiced deep-watered skipper by the name of Whitcannot the master of the schooner Roy Summers. I doubt that there are many left who can recall the rolling gait of this salty old seagoer, but by legend, many a son and daughter of the harbor's waterfront pioneer will recall the old man who licked Charlie Johnson. To spin this yarn and to get the perspective of this story, we've got to look back, a long way back. What's more, we've got to focus on the background. It was about 1901 when the Roy Summers stood out of the Golden Gate with granite ware, woolen goods, cotton prints, coffee, sugar, and a ton of spices, and the decks loaded of sawmill machinery headed north for Grace Harbor. Master the little schooner, which heeled and ran before the wind like a thing alive, was black-bearded, short-tempered Captain Whitcannot the strongest man who ever threw an unruly seaman overboard the side of his ship. With the wind holding, the captain reckoned that 10 or 12 days would see them crossing the harbor bar. If the bar was calm, the master himself would spit on his hands and bring his little ship into calm waters and ride up to the harbor dock without help from a man or boat. If things were rough, he might have to pick a pilot and ferry it up the harbor, a tug to take him in for safety. But things had to be rough to make Wick Kanaw say uncle. For the crew, it would be 10 or 12 days of black snake discipline and long hours. Wick Kanaw usually ran with a shorthand crew. Only the roughest would work with him, and those who did had to make up for the missing hands on the housers the vacant bars at the captain and long trips. For the captain, it would be as casual as a trip as he ever made, or would it? Well, it was choppy weather when the Roy Summers stood off the bar, and the sea was running full. So in spite of his urgings, Whitcannot took a line from the A.M. Simpson tug that had made the run down when he was sighted and came up harbor under tow. They warped her to the dock of the long-gone West Enslaved Mill that stood right about where the Hake plant is today. Well, legend has it that on occasion, the first time the captain ever snubbed a line around the harbor pier, he showed his salty scenes. He was tied up too far down the river for the yard master. Move that ship her length up river, he called out to the skipper of the Roy Summers. What's wrong with this, what Kanaw wanted to know. Never mind what's wrong, came back the yard master's voice. Move her up here and clear this berth. There were more words exchanged, with each of the two adding a little to the intensity of the answer. Well, to make the story short, the captain had enough words. He vaulted the rail, roaring like a wild bull. The yardmaster got a full-length look at his opposition and took off through the lumber piles. The captain raced back and forth among the piles, but the yardmaster was spry and better acquainted with the yard. He was gone. When Whitcannock could find no trace of his taunter, he picked a fight with a yard man piling lumber beside the ship knocked him down and kicked him, then stomped off, rumbling to himself. The Roy Summers stayed where it was birthed. No one touched the line. An hour later, the captain came out of his cabin 
with his sure going clothes on and hustled uptown with a hurried gait before before they had the steam up for the unloading. We know what Captain Whitkenoss saw when the first came ashore in Aberdeen. That is, we know it was a sawdust city with a seaport share of saloons crowded with tall timbermen as rough as a new rasp. And the sight that Aberdeen saw when Whitkenoss stepped off his ship was as historically worth noting. His hair was brushed to one side, and his handlebar mustache was trimmed and waxed. He wore his box coat with two brass buttons, and his boots were blacked and polished to a high gleam. For sea-going finery, there had been nothing to match him in these parts. His, his quite quickly finished about with his yardman, and had quieted the captain's nerves and had made a peaceful approach to the haunts of the seafaring men. He took one lap the length of Heron Street, down past Jimmy Hood's store, past Hans Stokes' meat market. He brushed past the saloons where his kind gathered in the noisy knots. He made the lap and saw it all. He noted the various resorts catering to the dry whistlers of seagoing men and stopped in front of Chummy's bar. He took a good look at the front, then went in. At the captain's, as the captain swung open the doors, more than one neck was craned to catch a glimpse of this powerful newcomer with the arms that hung nearly to his knees. It might have been a coincidence, but it was the sort of coincidence that makes good stories better. Anyhow, seated at the back table, drumming an empty noggin with his fingers, was Captain Genoa, the youngest saltwater skipper to sail the west. It was no coincidence that these two men knew each other. About a year before, the two and others had made their way out of a Brannigan in San Francisco's infamous Barbary Coast. It was one of those no hold barred seafaring Donnybrooks that left the floor littered with human wreckage. One of the participants never gained consciousness. When he died, a charge of manslaughter was filed against Whitcannot. It was Genoa's testimony that the captain fought in self-defense that resulted in this decision for his acquittal. They say the affair restrained Whitkena for a week or so. So, with that much in common, it was no surprise when the bull-necked German walked the full length of the bar and joined his sea-going cohort at the table. There were a few formalities. They exchanged brief descriptions of their trips north. Then they got down to the beefy course of the salt water talk. Other masters other keels, other bar rooms. And so the time passed. The man with the white apron made many trips to their tables, and when they got up to go, Genoa had noticed a noticeable list to port, and Wiccanaugh's face was flushed and his eyes just little black slits. They walked with a roll as though they didn't quite have their sea legs. Wiccanaugh bent slightly at the waist, looked like a huge ape in man's clothing. Outside, they paused for grunted exchanges of words, then took a tack for that haunt of seafaring men that they loved called the Palm Dance Hall on the avenue called Hume Street, now in the books as State Street. Now, perhaps we should say a word about the Palm. As frontier dance halls went, she was a beauty. Men in from the woods had to park their cock boots at the door and put on slippers provided by the management. The long bar was one of the spot's proudest possessions, while the place had been opened with a rip-roaring battle that left it in shambles to be rebuilt. It gained a little dignity through the reputation of its owner and manager, Charlie Johnson. Very few of its clientele 
threw their empty glasses at the mirror after the night Charlie Johnson had scarred up the celebrant's face with the broken edges of a smashed glass. And the reason they didn't throw the glasses and the reason for the observance of good manners was Charlie Johnson. Charlie Johnson was about the roughest man anyone had ever seen in a fight. He could handle almost any steamed up woodsman, cocked boots and all. When he threw them out into the streets, they stayed thrown. In fact, Charlie Johnson was the town's bully. He was tough, nothing less up than pug ugly. No one hereabouts had ever licked him and fewer even tried. The palm itself was a typical of a waterfront dance hall in ports the length of the coast. Dance halls below, hotel above, the bar across the back, an orchestra of two fiddlers and a piano, a few blinking electrical lamps dropped from the ceiling. That's all. But it was everything important for seagoing men just in port, and quite a place, as we'll see. Well, it was in the palm that the two captains strolled, or is that the right word? Anyhow, they arrived in the middle of the dance and stood uncertainly at the door while the caller finished his shouts of grind, red, got grind right and alaman left and say, swing your partner. And when he finished his chant with the parade to the bar, they paraded with the dancers. They joined in the dance when the orchestra started again, then paraded to the bar. They danced, they paraded, they danced, they paraded. Well, that's the way things went for some time. Finally, Genoa, a reasonably moderate man as seafarers went, decided to go. But not Wiccana. Genoa insisted. Wiccana disagreed. They argued, and Charlie Johnson stepped in. That, incidentally, as an index to point out the story, was where Charlie Johnson made his first blunder. He stepped between Wiccana and Genoa. He was facing Wiccana. S something tremendous about was about to happen. The captain of the Roy Summers was, full he was a full head shorter than Johnson. Besides, as we noted before, he was bent a little at the waist. When Charlie Johnson stepped in, Wiccana looked full and closely at the bright polka dot caveat of the dance hall king. And for a full moment, Wit cannot eye the heavy gold chain around Charlie Johnson's neck. He slowly looked up into the red veined face, eyed the bull neck, then looked down the figure before him to the heavy foot, to the heavy foot. Something inside the captain moving slowly reached a point of explosion. With a roar, he seized Charlie Johnson around his, tr around his middle and hugged. Charlie squirmed and twisted, his arms pinned at his sides by the hurricane captain. Spectators say Wiccana would have broken him like an egg if, it ha if he hadn't slipped on something. And in the tangle on the floor, Johnson broke the grip. He was first up and and his size 12 boots licked the captain's face full. It was kicking a bull. He showered kicks as the captain rose slowly. They had no effect. When Wick and I was vertical, Johnson dove in a flying fist and long arms of the captain swung back. His hammer-like hands fisted into clubs. They swung Solid punches standing toe-to-toe. -to -toe. When Johnson went down, Wiccana was too slow to follow his advantage. When the captain dropped, he rose out a hail of kicks and blows as though none were touching him. The shouting crowd that had gathered about them pushed back, forming a huge circle. There were partisan. Charlie's regular patrons showered him with the captains down. Charlie's enemies didn't dare to cheer when the proprietor was floored. As the two giants fought, 
the center of the combat worked towards the double doors of the entrance to the establishment. Wick and I was carrying, a fight, was carrying the fight, though Johnson's trekked, trekked two blows to the captain's one. They had little effect. Johnson was puffing, his face out and bleeding, while the captain bled from the cuts administered by Johnson's boots. He seemed inhumanly calm retained a crouch and lunged to strike his blows with wild savagery. At the doors, which were now open, with excited spectators crowding to them, Johnson thought to move the battle outside his lovely dance hall. He calculated his moves to take them through the entrance, but this is where he made a second error. He stepped out the single step of the door to the plank porch outside. The captain lunged and closed with him like a bear in a man's clothing, hugging, crushing, clamping onto the struggling Charlie Johnson and carrying him onto the planking. They rolled into the sawdust, Johnson kicking wildly, and stopped with the t captain on top. This time he had Johnson pinned with that titanious hug. The proprietor's kicks became slower. Finally, they stopped altogether. The crowd quietly backed away. The captain rose slowly, unsteadily, and stood looking down at a very quiet Charlie Johnson. He's killed him, someone shouted. The crowd surged forward, but just one step. The captain, now bleeding from many cuts, glowering, but with his box coat still buttoned, turned to face them menacingly. Genoa stepped through the line about him and took him by the arm. Wickena shook free, and as the crowd parted, the two deep seafarers walked out of the dim circle of light and into the darkness. Charlie Johnson? Oh, he recovered. It took a couple of buckets of water and some spiritus fermenteds. But the old Charlie was gone. He never fought again. Not long afterwards, he disappeared from the harbor. But Wickenham, why the captain came back many a roaring time and made a lot of good history in the harbor for the telling, we'll find him again some evening in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.